slightly tasty to my beautiful people. And have you ever looked at Postman Pat and realised how disgusting he is? Look at him. He's fucking horrible. I'm gonna cut his nose off. Now he looks even worse. Let me just, let me just look at that. Who has a sausage for a nose? And speaking of Postman Pat, when I did my original top 10 unpopular gaming opinions video years ago, I loved seeing what everyone had to say so much that I wanted to continue the subject. That's all I can say to preface this video in particular, so... And whether you agree with me or disagree with me in this video or the last video that I did, I'm not trying to be controversial, I'm not trying to troll anyone. This channel's all about having a laugh, and you should be doing that too. Of course, this is just my opinion on my own video, and you all have your own opinion maybe not on your own videos, but you all have your own opinions, and that's absolutely, totally fine, no matter what anybody tells you, about video games especially. So if you want to talk about this topic in the comments below, just don't be dicks. And please just try to enjoy the video, because this is a video on YouTube about video games hosted by me. It's not going to end your life, okay? Who here loves Luigi's Mansion? Good, because I do too. I like Luigi's Mansion 1 and I like Luigi's Mansion 2. But am I the only one that thinks the original one is way fucking better? Because I feel a little bit alone on that. The sequel is fantastic in many ways. The pace is faster, the controls are much smoother, it's portable, it's in 3D. But if you want a game that is way more representative of the title and a much more immersive experience, I think the first one kicks the second one out of the ballpark. <laughs> The original Luigi's Mansion leaves you, as Luigi, alone in a huge and spooky haunted gothic manor house. You have to explore the dark corners and investigate every eerie noise entirely on your own volition and remember where places of interest are while you try not to panic waiting for a jump scare and forget where you are and where you're going. And okay, the game isn't scary, look at it. If you're scared of that then you should pray to god you never run into a Teletubby in a dark alley. Okay, I take that back, that's fucking horrifying. But dude, it doesn't have to be terrifying. Its atmosphere alone makes it worth the purchase. In terms of game structure and pacing, it's the Resident Evil remake of Nintendo IPs. I'm not kidding. The second one in comparison is way too arcadey. It's too fast, too reactionary, too moment by moment. There's no major exploration, no getting lost, no unlocking more freaky corners of a huge open space. You just pick your stage and finish it. And again, that's fine. I like the game, but it ain't no Luigi's Mansion 1. And now since Nintendo announced a 3DS remake of the original game to give it the graphical overhaul it rightly deserves, I don't think I'll ever pick up the second again when I can play my preferred game on the same system. But hey, let's completely mirror the situation with another game series. Outlast. You know, I think Outlast 2 is fucking great. In fact, I think it's even better than the original. I still do not understand to this day why Outlast 2 got so much flack from so many reviewers and websites when it first came out. In fact, after reading a few of the reviews and watching a few videos about it, the complaints I see about the game I just don't think exist. It's almost like we played different games. I saw people complain mostly about the lack of direction and unfair deaths that can occur by enemies chasing you into dead ends, but honestly I never experienced that at all, aside from some of the trial and error shit the game tries to pull off in the school sequences. I honestly think that the game was just too effective in making everyone panic a bit too much to realise that there is a fair amount of funneling. The game is this dark for a reason, just follow the light sources. Even in some of the more scripted chases that make you feel like you're going to get caught any second, there are obvious places that you have to go towards. And if there already was lots of light everywhere, just take the other directions whenever you get blocked by enemies, you will find your way, and it isn't that hard. Honestly, I feel like it tested my logistical planning to the limit when being chased down to the death by crazy religious cultists screaming at me in the middle of a horrifying ghost town. I mean, yes, you're not going to feel like you know where you're going when you're in that situation. I kind of feel like that was the point of the horror in this game. And as the intro to the game beautifully demonstrates and lets you realise in the most daunting way imaginable, you won't be finding many secluded places and definite hiding places. This game is open. It's big. The possibilities of getting around and getting caught are genuinely pretty scary. And you never feel safe with things hiding in the looming darkness 360 degrees all around you. Even when you get inside buildings, you can be swarmed. It's insanely oppressive, but not impossible like everyone on the internet seems to think. I honestly found it just really fucking stressful and that's not a bad thing. Plus I prefer the grittier and more real looking enemies as opposed to the overly wrinkly sock puppets from Outlast 1. I mean in comparison, yeah I like Outlast 1, but with its claustrophobic blocky level design and herd any enemy that chases you around the table to get behind them like a fucking sheepdog gameplay, I found it much less stressful and an easier time. Again, the game is still good, but Outlast 2 was more experimental, ballsier, smarter and much freakier as a game in my opinion. Plus, THAT FUCKING THING IN THIS GOAL can fuck yourself in it, sticky old fucking fuck up. And speaking of sticky, as in analog yeah, sticky, yeah, yeah. I'm really sorry to upset anybody here, but I think that the Insane Trilogy controls are fucking fantastic. 
Well, I mean, aside from the bike and the jet ski, no clue what happened there, but as for the rest of them goes, I actually love them. Yes, they are different, in fact, very different, because Crash's jump arc has been significantly changed so you fall faster. It can make the three classic games a little bit more challenging on a repeat visit, but what's wrong with that exactly? The controls aren't broken, they feel insanely satisfying to use to me. They're snappy, responsive, and I love how less floaty they feel in comparison to the original games, and are totally the same over every single game, unlike the original PS1 trilogy, which is especially good for the original Crash. And now after playing the Insane trilogy, I can't enjoy Crash 1 on PS1 that much at all anymore. It's just one of the dopiest control styles for such difficult level design ever created. Yes, you can argue that Crash can slip off of enemy shells, especially in the first game if you bounce in the same place over and over again, but come the fuck on guys, why would you do this anyway? It rarely happens on anything else you bounce off of unless you clip it so close to the edge that I'm not surprised that you fall off. And even that aside, what's wrong with having the platforming just be a little bit more precise? and just that little bit less safe. You can't rely on taking your time with some of these sequences. I was hoping for a little bit of a physics tweak, especially for a remake, and to be honest, I think I've died more in Crash 2 and 3 from floatier, hard to position physics on boxes above pits than anything from Insane. It just feels more solid to me. I love how fast he hits the floor, and Crash's feet feel like they snap better towards boxes without the need of carrying his momentum, like in Crash 3 especially. The same goes for the ice physics. I found them much more manageable, and how about that slide jump? It's quicker, slicker, and way more fun to use. But while on the topic of controls in video games generally, can I just say that I think the Xbox One controller is a big old piece of ass, and I completely feel alone in thinking that. I don't think anybody seems to agree with me on this. I am fine with the 360 controller with the lovely cupping my hands feel around the edges of it. Oh. <laughs> and I like the comfortable D-pad, but why the hell they felt like they needed to downgrade the controller in nearly every way for the next system up and then up the price just baffles me. At least, in my opinion. Can never make that clear enough with the internet. I don't know what I can really say about this controller, honestly. I've been using it for years on PC until I got my DualShock 4 USB dongle, and I just never got along with it in my entire time using it. To start with, it feels flimsy to me. The controller is nice and light, but because of that, it feels a bit brittle. The sticks have little resistance or cushioning, the triggers feel extremely loose and don't have a satisfying pushback, the shoulder buttons feel cheap and crappy and incredibly stiff, the same as the D-pad, and because of this the controller is a little louder than I'd like. Here is me applying the same amount of pressure from my thumb to the sticks on the 360 controller and the One controller. The sticks just smack the edges of the plastic pretty loudly, especially compared to other controllers, and the clicking of the shoulder buttons and D-pad are really loud to me. And that D-pad, oh, my least favourite part of the controller for sure, feels horrible to use for me. It's stiff, it's clicky, it requires more pressure than necessary to work, and it isn't ideal for 2D games along with the flimsy, flicky analogue stick. I remember playing Cuphead on Xbox One with this controller, and then when I went onto PC and used my DualShock 4, I was able to get through the game in hours less time. Oh, and if there was ever a way to turn off the front-facing controller light while playing on PC, I never fucking found it, so I'm sorry if this is an invalid criticism, but playing this thing in a dark room was horrible because of that. The DualShock 4 light bar reflecting off of dark air areas of the TV was bad enough, but at least you could dim it. But here on PC, the Xbox One controller just constantly screams at your eyes. <laughs> also, I just don't find it that comfortable. I don't like this controller. And you know what else I don't like? No, I'm kidding, I love the Nintendo Switch, but what I don't like is the price of the Nintendo Switch, and the price of the accessories, and the games, and everything else that goes along with it. This thing here, it, it's way too much money, especially in the UK, I mean look- Look guys, I fucking adore the Nintendo Switch. I've played this thing non-stop since I got it. It's a fantastic portable console with the benefit of controller vibration. It's a pretty damn decent home console, has tons of incredible features like the multiple ways you can use the Joy-Cons and screen docked and undocked, the fact that nearly every major title and port released for it has been top-notch quality, there's a lot to love and compared to the Wii U, I'm shocked Nintendo even bothered releasing that thing with all the Wii U games being ported to the Switch especially. Except for Zombie U for some reason. Fix that shit Nintendo please, this one's good. Okay, okay, I buy a But also fix the price of the thing because holy hell is all of this expensive. In fact, it's absolutely absurd for what you actually get when you take a step back. The concept is novel and extremely well executed and the games are fantastic, but that does not excuse this much money milking. If you lived in the UK and went to Amazon, just as an example, and grabbed just the console on its own, 
Zone, an extra two Joy-Cons for four-player action on some games, and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, a port of a four-year-old Wii U game at this point, this will set you back a total of £385.90. That's $522.85. And okay, this may not sound too bad, you may be thinking, for some fucking reason, but let's make it worse. What do you get for this much money and the most basic of beginnings for a multiplayer setup? Firstly, not that much power to the system for what you pay, especially compared to something like the PS4 Pro. And yes, obviously the PS4 Pro isn't portable, but the Switch and the PS4 Pro are still home consoles at the same time, and the Switch is considerably less powerful than the competition, which is fine, but still very expensive for that fact. Secondly, you get a messy eShop store with terrible categories and with barely any fucking support for some of Nintendo's greatest games of the past, which I'm sure the Switch could easily play and Nintendo could easily sell. Thirdly, the battery life. No matter what game you play, is still not that great out of the dock and only lasts me three to five hours at most before needing to charge up again. And what else? Well, you also get a 32 gigabyte hard drive, which is pathetic, and even some games exceed that basic limit on its own, so spend more money on an SD card to extend the space. Let's just say with an extra 120 gigabyte card, which still isn't close to other consoles. There's no way to externally charge the controllers at all unless you get an additional battery pack, or even maybe the charging grip at £24.99 because the Switch's grip doesn't let you charge through it. And hey, maybe when you aren't playing Mario Kart with your friends, you'd love a single player game, so grab the newest Zelda. Yep, that's another £47.99. You'll definitely need a screen protector just in case your Switch gets deeply scratched on the day you fucking get it from wonky docking stations. So along with it being a fucking pain in the ass that you may not even be able to replace depending on how long you have the Switch and what unaware your dock may be wonky, meaning starting from scratch again, that's another £6.99 for a decent screen protector. And despite the relatively low battery life of the thing in portable mode, you aren't given a USB-C cable or adapter to charge it without the dock, so definitely spend another £15.99 for a decent length cable. And in my experience, my dock was wonky and did scratch my Switch on the day that I got it, and luckily I got it replaced. But before that, I got five hours into Mario Odyssey, which I wasn't able to save onto my SD card, add to my Nintendo account as a cloud save, or even transfer onto the new Switch replacement I got because I had to give the old one into the game store I got it from in order to replace it. This is the most expensive fucking headache I've ever had! And this isn't even including monthly online fees for competitive games from September 2018 onwards. The ridiculous £60 Pro Controller if your hands are a bit too beefy for the Joy-Cons, the optional 22 99 control charging dock, and again, the fact that most Nintendo property games are so fucking highly priced for absolutely no reason that a four-year-old Mario game port can be sold at £42, yet a brand new port of NSEN will retail at £14 less. The issue with that being that you buy into Nintendo to, well, buy into Nintendo, so most of the games you buy will be of this high price tag. Don't get me wrong though, the Switch is fantastic, one of the best home and portable consoles I've played in recent memory, and I love it. But fuck the price tag, I'd rather tongue Yoshi. And while we're on the subject of calling out Nintendo, in my opinion, CTR is better than Mario Kart! And although I'm sure many of you will read that as I hate Mario Kart, that couldn't be any further from the truth. In fact, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe on the Switch is my second favourite kart racer of all time, closely followed by Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed, and then followed by that, Mario Kart Double Dash. But the raw sensation of hectic, insane, tense kart racing chaos, in my opinion, hasn't been matched to CTR. And no, not just because of the Crash characters. If Mario had done all the shit CTR did before it, I'd be wanking him off instead. In fact, in many ways, CTR took the gameplay style power-ups and such directly from Mario Kart, so I have to thank Mario a lot here. It's not that different from Mario Kart, which is why at its core it's such a great kart racer. But I honestly just find the game feel of CTR elevates it beyond any other kart racer I've played to this day. The speed, the gritty aggressive engine roars clashing with the cartoony bouncy sound effects, the excellent soundtrack, the insanity of the animations, the characters taunting and yelling at each other, the speed boosts that increase in power depending on how far you jump off of ramps, and the shaky crunchy landing. Power-ups coming and going every single second, collecting 10 Wumper Fruit to make whatever power-up you have way more effective or even totally different, the insanely satisfying drifting and boosting that can triple the effect of it if you time the opposite drifting button at the right moment during a drift, the Diddy Kong racing style adventure mode with bosses, shit to unlock, collectathon elements and incredibly difficult but incredibly brilliant time trials, teaching shortcuts and testing your patience to the limit. I love this game so much and after the insane trilogy met with critical acclaim I want vicarious versions to remake it! This next unpopular opinion though is one that I don't have much to say on. Life is strange. It's okay. It's all right. It's average. I mean, I just feel completely indifferent about it. It's really hard for me to go into much detail. I just find it all right. It's okay. Life is strange, despite the legions of fans, memes, and critical acclaim, 
just didn't impact me whatsoever. It had fantastic moments and deeply emotional story scenes affected by your choices, but I don't know guys, I played it and then I forgot it. I wasn't fond of the cringy fucking script trying so desperately to appear hip and cool, and I have mixed feelings about the way you're given practically no time limit for choices or immediate risk to your choices because you can quickly rewind time in order to change how those immediate events pan out. Yeah, you can see how things pan out right then and there and change it if you're not sure about it, which is a cool idea, but you're given way too much time and freedom to think about the future events this could affect, and you aren't ever thrown into do or die situations like Heavy Rain or Until Dawn, where you need to react and make choices under pressure. You know, like real life. Making the outcome of your choices that much more impactful to your skill of decision making and the story. But you don't get that here, instead you just get a character that can turn back time for absolutely no reason at all, and that just leads to fannying around and bumbling with little to no stress or weight of consequences with how much time you have to consider what the hell to do. And when I say that, I don't mean that the consequences of your choices don't mean anything at all, because they do, but I think they would mean ten times more if you were thrown into more pressure-filled situations. And that's all I can say, because that's the bulk of the adventure narrative gameplay of Life is Strange. It's alright, in my opinion. It's okay. What I don't find okay, though, are the controls in Super Metroid. Super Metroid, damn, I only played you for the first time about two years ago, and I I loved you, but you control not that well for me. If you look at Super Metroid purely from a music, aesthetic, boss, structure and level design standpoint, it's clear why this is considered by many to be one of the best games ever made, and I never hear many people talk about the controls because everyone seems to like them, but... I'm sorry, I don't. And I think I can let the game speak for itself here. I mean, imagine that you're playing it for a second. Look at all of this shit going on. Airborne enemies, ground enemies, enemies at different altitudes, projectiles to avoid. And how do you deal with all of this? By moving and jumping and shooting, yes. But with these three major things getting in the way a lot of the time for me. One, you have no ability to lock your position and aim freely. Two, you have a crouching stance for some enemies that is activated by cycling through different down button stances. And three, you have a jump that heavily favours Samus's vertical trajectory and barely her horizontal. And with those three things, every issue you can imagine rising from them does rise up, at least for me, and I feel like I got a load of unfair deaths because of it. No position locking and free aiming means, well, I don't need to explain that, especially after playing Metroid 2 on 3DS. It's way more restrictive in comparison. And yeah, the shoulder buttons pointing upwards to the left and the right isn't bad, but aiming downwards is a fucking nightmare with you needing to move at the same time, usually leading to falling off edges or running into the thing that you're aiming at. The stance side Cycling with the down button for those smaller enemies though also causes issues, mainly that you can easily overshoot the crouch stance in tense situations into the vulnerable morph ball state and then need to tap back out of it again. Also it just doesn't feel that natural, tapping down and then tapping up again in the middle of a run and gun, it's really odd, especially with no locking position command. And finally with the jumping, lord the jumping, it's great for climbing up levels but for getting across slightly longer pits, tiny platforms, avoiding small enemies and even projectiles, it isn't very reliable. Samus launches herself straight up and doesn't have much movement to the left or right, which doesn't mesh too well with the claustrophobic caves if you ask me. And now that I think about it, some levels don't even give you a good idea of what's directly above you anyway, and so you may accidentally jump into threats multiple times. And it's hard to tell how hard to press the jump button for specific gaps because of that. Do you hit what's above you, or just fall into the pit of acid? And yes, this is a platformer, so there are a lot of pits of acid here. I don't know guys, I love Super Metroid, but I just don't think the controls overall have aged well at all. It's still playable and a classic, but after everything I heard about the game, I was shocked nobody warned me about how out of place these controls felt in this style of game. Plus, no matter how many fucking times I replay the game, don't understand how wall jumping works. I just don't get it. I know that's probably my fault and I'm embarrassed by it, but it isn't fun. You know what is fun though? This game, yeah? Yes, I really feel alone with his opinion. Aside from the cart though, that isn't a cart, it's more like a I'd happily replay ukulele multiple times. I really bloody enjoyed it. It's adorable. Since I did my review of it ages ago and mentioned I wasn't a Banjo-Kazooie fan, so spoke entirely as a non-nostalgic eyewitness, now at this point in time I've even played through most of Banjo, and I really bloody enjoyed that too with nothing in Banjo changing my opinion or perspective on how I felt about Yuka. It's not amazing, but I just found it a fun collectathon, itching and squirming to be explored in every possible direction, with lovely visual detail, great music, funny classic British dry scripting and characters, fun and bouncy controls with insanely fun abilities, and no, I didn't think the camera was that bad at all. I would say more, but I already did a video in depth all about it, so click on that annotation thing on the screen of your phone or PC right now and go and see it, alright? Technology is fantastic. <laughs> and while you're contemplating clicking on that link to go to the video, 
Just listen out for this. What I consider to be my most unpopular gaming opinion. I, I feel completely alone in thinking this, so I don't think many people agree with me, and I don't think you're ready for it. Are you ready for it? Okay, let's go. I don't think that exclusives on consoles are killing the game industry whatsoever. I know there are many people out there massively against this and don't think this is good for the regular consumer. And you know what? You're probably right. Bayonetta comes out on PC, Xbox and PS3, then the sequel comes out on Wii U only. What's that shit about? Now, with your non-endless funds, you need to buy a new console, wasting your money on a thing you had no intention to buy and just fueling a corrupt economy. And that's a totally fair way of looking at it. But here's the thing loads of people tend to forget. Bayonetta 2, for an example, wouldn't have existed without Nintendo. And that's the cold hard fact. Life is fucking tough, and if you were a game developer unable to acquire third-party funding or a publisher for your passion project, if one company who believed in you came along and saved your ass in exchange for leaving the game exclusively with the company that helped make it happen, consumer advocacy aside, I think many people would take the offer. The sad truth is that not every single person in the world owns the same system, which is a double-edged sword. Like with Bayonetta 2 as the example again, loads of people weren't interested in the Wii U and felt completely gypped. But again, loads of people were interested in the Wii U and already had it, so now they had a great game to play and felt justified in their purchase. You are never going to please absolutely everyone, and when it comes between getting the game out in the first place at all, I pick that option, even if I don't have the system the game is on in the first place. Why should I wish these poor souls misery for not having a game release for their system just because I don't have it? It's not their fault it happened when they bought the console, and it's not my fault I didn't buy the console, and it's definitely not the developer's fault that only one company believed in them. Unfortunately, it's just one of those things, and yeah, there are some things I wish I could have played at release years ago but couldn't afford it at the time, but you know what? There were tons of things I managed to play that I loved no one else were able to, and this was especially true during my teenage years when everything was 360 versus PS3. But what I found is that by eventually buying into separate systems, I never looked at it as another random investment I threw my money away to, but instead a new gateway to even more games I never knew existed. Not to mention, what's wrong with a little competition? Sales unfortunately drive most of the capitalist world we live in and if you encourage your in-house developers and teams to create even better games in the competition to sell more copies and sell more consoles, then that just means better games for everyone whether you own the competing system or not, since you know that at some point, at some time, you will eventually get something special if you think you missed out. Not to mention even prices become more competitive and better for everyone and that's one of the many reasons the PlayStation succeeded in many ways over the Saturn back in the day. Yes, you know what, it would be a lot easier if there was just one video game system for everybody and it were totally fair game. but. Could you imagine the consumer fuckery that could arise from that? If there were only one system and no Steam or anything like that, why would any company need to even try? They could release whatever they wanted and charge whatever they wanted with no care in the world because what else have you got, eh? Why do you think even the Wii of all things had so much shitty shovelware? Because it was the highest selling console of the time and they knew they could do the occasional screwy exploitable cash grab to keep the thing alive for years. Even companies nowadays try to screw customers over all the time, even in this climate. So I I really failed to see how having one system would make things any better. One of the rebuttals I'm sure I'll get for saying all of this is that there's situations like the rise of the Tomb Raider timed exclusivity on Xbox One. Yeah, that's fucking bullshit. That's just taking bribery for having the game on a console that you just want to be able to sell before it goes on every other system. That's just fucking ridiculous. I don't get that. And of course, there are exclusives for consoles that just have no support, like the PS Vita. I fucking love the PS Vita, and the exclusives for it, I've also loved. But when I'm trying to tell people that these games are fantastic, it's not worth the PS Vita because there's nothing else going on for it. The support for it is so depressingly lacking that it's just like, why did you make them exclusive in the first place? You could have made more money just releasing them on other things, and in fact, that's what they did with Tearaway. They just made it on PS4 anyway. And yeah, apart from those two examples, I do feel totally alone in thinking that console exclusives and such are not a problem at all, along with the other choices in this video, actually. But what do you think? Do you agree with me? Disagree with me? Want me to burn in hell? Comment below and get the conversation going. Unpopular opinions are one of my favourite things to talk about, and with something as fun and as silly as video games, nobody has the right or wrong opinion. And there you have it, everybody, another 10 unpopular gaming opinions from myself, which I'm sure will piss a lot of you off. And if it pisses you off, I guess it's because you're an angry person, I don't know. And if you are one of those needlessly angry people, just remember this. My opinion is final. There's no such thing as other opinions. I'm the only one allowed to have an opinion. No, there's no other unpopular gaming opinions out there. No, there's just, there's nothing. No one else is allowed.
but thank you so much for watching this video on unpopular gaming opinions well more unpopular gaming opinions yes I got another 10 from another video a few years back so go and check that out if you want to on the screen in a few seconds and special thanks to every single person on the screen right now for all their help that they've given this channel via patreon during YouTube's ridiculous nonsense with demonetization and stuff and special thanks to all the top tier supporters Omar Matu, Basil, Patrick Ferguson, Robert Alamsha, I Have a Portal Gun, Gamer Man, Chris Ingersoll, Exopaz, Kyle Way, Thomas Olsen, Mills Kahai, Alicia Knightley, Super Spyro Fan 2010, Daniel Leon, Jane Ives, Mitchell Reed, AD Thornton Smith, Oblivion Rising, Noxious, Ellen Rilpley, Kirsten B, QB, Nathan Young, and Nicole Ganara. Thank you so much, every single one of you.